My name is Chris McCool. I lead the Agricultural Robotics Group here at the University of Bonn. Um, and as Hannah said, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we do in terms of robotic vision and how we apply that within the context of precision agriculture, and in particular how we do that within the context of FENAROB, of course. Now, if you want some more information about my group, there's a website here, and it'll be there at the end as well. Now, we work with a range of different robotic systems that you can see here. So this is just a bit of a short list of the systems that we use, and I'll briefly describe them to you. So on the left-hand side, you can see BonBot, or the CP4 robot that we use for weed management, but not just weed management. You're also going to see that we use that to do things like crop and weed monitoring. And then on the right-hand side, we've got uh, PadoBot, and this is a glasshouse platform that runs through cropping systems like sweet pepper that you can see in that image, as well as tomato, to understand the state of that crop and to understand what's going on and to potentially interact with it. And later on, you'll see it also has a UR5 um, attached to it. Then the center, we also run some UAVs. So you can see an M300 at the top here that we run within a project looking at how we do before and after analysis for weeding efficacy and in particular looking at mechanical tools within that particular project. And down below, you can see we've got a Husky platform, which we use for development and prototyping. And that particular instance, you can see we're deploying that within an orchard environment for apples. Now, why do we do robotic vision for all of these different platforms? It's so that we can understand the scene and to be able to interact with that scene, to enable the robots to take some interesting actions, whether that's extra sensing or an actual intervention action, such as for the CP4 or BonBot. Why is this challenging? Well, if I was in a big presentation, I'd probably pause for a minute or so and ask you to look at this image. So this is an image taken in Southeast Queensland, uh, in Australia of sweet pepper, field grown sweet pepper, where the environment is really challenging. And this is sometimes a task that we give to our robotic or autonomous systems to actually solve. And it's really challenging. So you've got green leaves in front, you've got green sweet pepper in the background. And I'd ask you, how many sweet pepper do you see in this image? But given that we're still on Zoom, I'm gonna solve this for you. I hope you can at least appreciate that this is an extremely challenging problem, but we wanna be able to do this well and accurately so we can actually find in this case, the six different sweet pepper within that image. Now, to solve that problem, we, of course, use image data, um, but we concentrate in my group not just on the image data that you see on the left-hand side, in this case, for a sweet pepper in glasshouse environment. We also use depth information, and you can see a visualization of that on the right-hand side where the white points or the light points are further away from the camera, and the pretty dark points that you see are actually no depth was calculated there. So we combine this information so we can do far more interesting uh, monitoring within the field. And you'll see some examples of that later today. We do not just only that, we also make use of the temporal information. Okay, so as we go through, hopefully you can see the video going through there, we take information about how the crop um, can be seen by the system over time. And you'll see how we exploit that information as well in this presentation later on. Now I'm gonna to talk to you in the context of how we do this for two particular robotic systems. You're gonna see BonBot1 on the left-hand side, which is the weed management platform. And you're also gonna see this for PadoBot in the glasshouse environment um, later on in the second half of this presentation as well. But for the first part, I'm gonna talk how we use BonBot and how we actually use this to do. And for both of these robots later on, I'm gonna talk about first autonomous navigation um, for this system, because this is actually a really important aspect. And then I'm gonna talk about field monitoring and how we apply that to both BonBot and to PadoBot both in terms of the arable farming scenario, but also in the glasshouse scenario. You can see a visualization of one bot on the right-hand side. Although we say it's for weed management, and it is, it's also to be able to do that, capturing really rich information about how many crop we have in the field. You'll see also we can look at how big or how much area that particular uh, crop takes, but also the weeds and potentially the weed species. And so when I'm talking about this system, I'm talking about how it does things like uh, Segmentation, you can see an example in the bottom right, how we talk about um, segmentation for images, semantic segmentation. You can see that there's different colors. This is for the different plant species. In this case, the crop is in magenta and in sugar beet and the different colors of the different weed species. Hopefully you can also see that there's a center point and this is actually the center of the plant. And so what we're doing is we know where each plant is. And so we're doing something that's called instance-based as in where each plant is, semantic segmentation, knowing where things are so the robot can interact, but also measure the size of that crop. And this is important for field monitoring. But before we get there, a really important task 
these robots is to actually go through the field and navigate through the field. Now, why is that important? It's because we've got different fields that we want to deal with, even in Finerol, but also farms in general. You can see the idea on the right-hand side here. We've got, for instance, fava bean. We've got maybe lemon balm in the middle, so fava bean on the top right. And we've got sugar beet in the bottom right. And we've got these different crops, and they're actually seeded. So if we have GPS-guided systems, we may still not actually have precise GPS coordinates for where we've actually seeded. So we need to know locally how to maneuver the vehicle so we don't actually hit it. And humans do that. Um, but we sometimes need to do this also with robots to be able to deal with a range of different farming scenarios. And what we're doing in this work is exploiting the fact that when we plant or seed, we're mostly doing, we're doing this primarily with a very simple row structure where we've got parallel uh, kind of lanes of the row structure. And you can see that there for the three crop, crops that we have. So how we approach this within the context of getting the CP4 robot or Bonbot to actually navigate through is that we try and exploit and automatically detect these crop lanes. And you can see the three different scenarios down below with the same algorithm. Okay, so the first step that you see in the top is detecting the different crop lanes. And then as we navigate through, which is step two, following the center of the crop lane, so we've estimated this and you'll see this shortly, we then get to the end of the row and we need to actually switch over. Okay, and at this point, we take advantage of what we did in the first step, which was to count and detect the actual number of crop lanes that we had underneath the robot to switch over that number automatically to then start navigating again through in step four. So how do we approach this particular scenario in terms of being able to automatically detect the different crop lanes and navigate through? Well, what we do in the first step is use uh, traditional, for the whole system, this is fairly traditional computer vision uh, features, we go through and do vegetation or green segmentation, and you can see the example for the different uh, three different crops that I was talking about down below. So we can apply it to any crop where we've got this lane structure. And we do simple thresholding with Otsu thresholding, fairly stock standard, just assuming that there is in fact two classes in terms of the vegetation and the soil. And from that, we can then look at the different vegetation areas, do some connected components to find the areas where we believe different plants for the crop exist. And although this will lead to some issues, and you can see that in the center where we've got um, under segmentation for the plants, in this case for uh, lemon balm, and then potentially over segmentation, where we've got a sparse field like on the right hand side for sugar beet, it still gives us the guiding principle that what we're after is the crop lane going straight down. And so we can fit things like a Hoff transform to the output of these magenta dots, which are the crop centers. So we can go through and estimate where the lanes that have been seeded actually are. And then we can get the average of this, which is the blue line that you see in the three images down below. And this is the line that we're actually gonna follow for navigation. And so you can see this kind of principle in action. Uh, this is actually running real time on the robot within Kleiner Altendorf. Um, and what you see here in this video is some of the experiments that we've done last year within campus Kleiner Altendorf. So the robot here is going through and navigating through fiber beam. And what it's done already, when you start this video, you can see that it's already started navigating. So it's already detected the two crop rows that are underneath. You can see it's tracking, in this case, with the red line until it gets to the end of the crop row. And then it's gonna do the step three, which is a switching. So now it's gonna start trying to match features from the crop row going across until it's counted that it's got a new crop row, and in this case, two new crop row, using features like SIFT features to try and actually do that. So again, we're using fairly traditional um, computer vision approaches to keep this simple running real time on the robotic system. And that's really important for BonBot because we do want to do uh, weed management and crop monitoring in a fairly automated way. Um, just a few comments about BonBot. Uh, we are building up towards experiments using the actual uh, weed management system being developed as you can see on the left hand side so you can see the weed management system uh, in blue there currently being set up for spray systems that consists of four replicated uh, linear access tools and this allows us to have the flexibility to move the tool without having to replicate for instance if we had a tool covering five centimeters across the one and a half meters that would be replicating 30 tools and the idea here is that you can then switch uh, although we've designed it initially with a spray system, we also have a mechanical tool that we plan on deploying later this year. But as I mentioned, BonBot is not just about being able to do weed management, but also about doing crop monitoring because we need to do that to do successful weed management. 
So I'm going to talk to you briefly about how that actually works in terms of field monitoring for BonBot, because it can gather a whole range of really interesting information about the state of the field as it runs through that particular environment. But I'm going to talk to you first about this in terms of the context of Paderborn, okay? Because this is where some of the initial algorithms were actually developed that we used. Uh, and when I'm talking about this, I'm talking primarily in terms of sweet pepper detection. So this is a chance to kind of reorientate uh, your thinking in terms of going from the outside arable farming scenario now to the indoor glasshouse scenario. We're talking about detecting different sweet pepper and understanding the state of the field. Now, some of this research started uh, before I came to Bonn, while I was still at Queensland University of Technology. And there we looked at deep learning approaches to apply this to actually doing uh, crop monitoring to have um, in situ uh, understanding of what's going on with the environment. And we use these deep learning approaches. Uh, you can ignore most of the left hand side of that image. This is just to say that we have a complicated fast RCNN approach. And what we were doing was adding some extra parts onto the end in terms of parallel or hierarchical kind of approaches so that we could jointly estimate not just the fruit that was present, and that's the four brown background in that image here, or FG slash BG, but also the quality. So in terms of ripeness estimation. And when we were deploying this, uh, we were using and exploiting the fact that we could actually track and count objects within the field by exploiting the fact that as the camera, in this case, it was a handheld camera, moves through the field, you would have an initial image, which would be the orange image that you see here. And then over time, we could get a second image, but we wouldn't have moved much, okay? So now we can start tracking that if one ob object overlaps with another one, we can start saying it's the same object. And because thankfully fruit and crop in the field don't actually move very much, we can assume they're relatively static objects. And that allowed us to do tracking. So in this video I'm gonna show you that was from previous work at QUT, we're tracking both green sweet pepper by drawing a green bounding box, a mixed color sweet pepper by drawing an orange bounding box, and a red sweet pepper by drawing a red bounding box. And the numbers that you can see here are us counting the fruit just with a handheld cam camera, making these kind of fairly simple assumptions and just doing detection, drawing a bounding box around each fruit. And you can see that works pretty well, um, even in these kind of challenging conditions. This is a protected cropping environment up in North Queensland in Guru, um, which has similarities, I guess, to glass house environments that you'd see in Europe. Now we've advanced this quite a bit further because we don't just want to do detection, we also want to know per pixel where things are. And so we've been deploying this and actually updating this. You can get some details about this in the Frontiers paper, details of which are at the bottom of this page to do not just um, crop detection or plant detection, but also segmentation. So we can get, as you can see on the right hand side of that image, the mask output of where per pixel the particular crop or plant is. Uh, the big point about that paper as well is being able to do this for a range of different environments using exactly the same framework. So we use the same framework for Paddlebot that you saw for, that you're gonna see uh, applied to sweet pepper, but also plant applied to plant detection and segmentation. Now, in a similar way, we also build up the hierarchical approach. And you can see that also on the right-hand side here, where if we talk about the FCN or the fully connected uh, layer at the end, what we have is the super category coming out. And that would be, for instance, a fruit or a sweet pepper, or in the case of arable farming, a plant being detected. And then the subcategory would be, in the case of a plant, the species of that particular plant uh, being provided. Or in the case of sweet pepper, you saw that previously in terms of the ripeness estimation, whether it's green, so immature, mixed, so breaking color and heading to maturity as a crop. And then in terms of the, um, the full color, in that case, red. So we build this hierarchy within a mask RCNN approach and then apply it to uh, the particular domains by exploiting some prior information. So previously we were assuming that there was no prior information and that we just assumed there was good overlap uh, between the temporal sequences. And that meant that we didn't really have any prior information about how things like the camera moved. But we're deploying this on robotic systems. So we exploit the fact that we have this temporal information and we have the depth cameras. So we have some spatial information, some structure about the scene. And so we can take that and use that to actually estimate and predict where things should be in the future. And you can see that kind of idea here. So what we do is we take the initial guess, 
from the orange frame and kind of understand how we've moved within the scene, exploit the fact that we've got a fairly static scene because things don't move very much in agriculture, and then predict where we're actually going to see that object in the future. And this allows us to do far better tracking and improve the output of the deep neural networks. So all this is doing is taking the output of the neural networks, predicting where it should be in the future, so we can do a better job of doing the tracking. And you can see that being deployed here. So keep in mind now that we're also doing instance-based semantic segmentation. We're detecting per plant what pixels are associated to that plant. We're also still drawing the bounding box around that plant. And we're using this idea of predicting where it should be for the robot in the next frame to actually do really good tracking that's highly accurate within much less than 10% of the overall count of both the crop and the weed. What you also see here is that we're further exploiting the fact that we've got the depth information from the camera to provide the viewable area of each plant. So there's an extra number up here, which is effectively the number of square meters or size of that particular viewable area of that plant. And not just of the crop, in this case, sugar beet, but also of each of the different weeds. So we can understand what the state of the field is before we wanna take some kind of informed action. And you can also see that we do this not just in the arable farming scenario that you see here, but also within the context of sweet pepper, as you can see here, with exactly the same kind of principles working, we can estimate the scene, predict where the sweet pepper should be in the future, even for this really challenging scene where now we've got high levels of occlusion from both the leaves and other parts of the plant, uh, occluding the particular object that we're trying to find, in this case, the sweet pepper. And again, we're providing the viewable area of the sweet pepper, which provides a sum quartz estimate of the actual size of that particular fruit within the field. This is all really interesting information. Um, and we got this by using an estimate of how the robot moved, which was relatively coarse. So what we actually were using in those, in those particular works were we were using the wheel odometry, just an estimate for how far uh, the robot has moved. It's actually a fairly poor estimate. And so we also showed recently in, in deploying one bot that you can further improve this by incorporating the rich information set that we have available. In this case, you can see on Bombot, we've got um, some really nice GPS sensors. And what we did was then include that within that. So this is still fairly real time to actually estimate what's in the field. And this is applied to cornfield, which is more challenging than sugar beet because in this case, the crop is quite leafy and much harder to track for various reasons. And we improved the um, percentage count of the uh, plants. This is not just crop, but crop and weed within the field, basically halving uh, that down to three and a half percent of what is actually visible within the field. Uh, and this is work that's under review for IROS. You can also use this to visualize your field in slightly different ways. Uh, so if you consider the context of Padobot and going through a glasshouse environment, detecting the different sweet pepper within the field, because we've got this depth sensor, we can go through and actually think that we could visualize this in 3D, like you can see here, so we can understand what we've got um, in 3D uh, and visualize that and try and understand the state of that environment. And then we can further integrate things like the semantic information or the detections that we have so that you can view the field in a very different way. You can start viewing where you've got different crop within the field. Uh, this is another map, um, being able to understand where you do have crop and where you do not have crop. Uh, and this initial visualization will be extended to include other uh, information about that. So you can see problems within the particular glasshouse environment, but you can think about how to do this also within an arable cropping environment as well. Now I mentioned quite a bit that we're using both the depth information, the structure information, but also temporal information. And currently you've mostly seen how we do that for the output of deep neural networks. We're also looking at how we can use that within deep neural networks themselves. And some of these methods are called recurrent neural networks that get used to actually incorporate the spatial information to do more accurate semantic segmentation, for instance. There's often a bottleneck here. And one of the bottlenecks is that it's hard to actually get fully labeled data for temporal sequences. I mean, it's already hard to find fully labeled data for still images and for temporal sequences, this is much more challenging. So our work conducted by Ali Reza, we looked at how we can actually build up virtual samples to do this. And this is just a brief overview of that work that was submitted to Dagam last year, where basically we take some labeled images, estimate how we move, 
uh, both across the horizontal, but also potentially in the vertical axis. Uh, and that's visualized by mu w, sigma w. And then we cut up the image to make virtual temporal sequences. And that actually goes through with the output being on the right-hand side and provides these uh, initial training samples to bootstrap the system that tends to actually uh, let the network learn far more rapidly how to actually fit this and improve the overall performance of things like semantic segmentation. In this case, you can see it's trying to predict where all the pixels for the sweet pepper are. And we're not just looking at how to use temporal models, but we're also looking at how we can incorporate both the structure of the scenes, so spatial temporal models and the temporal information within uh, neural, neural networks. And that's currently under review for RAL. So um, how you can actually use this temporal information and incorporate the prior of the structure of an environment and actually improve the output of your deep neural network system itself. So hopefully you've seen today how we use these different systems to provide intelligence to the robots and you can understand why this is really important to understand, uh, not just for being able to enable things like a weed management action, but to understand the state of the field and how we can visualize some of that using the structural or depth information that we capture. Uh, the group also does a whole range of work that I'm not going to have time to talk about. Um, we didn't talk in depth about the temporal and spatial temporal models, uh, as I mentioned. We do some work around semi-supervised learning. So how can we make the best use of the limited data that we actually have available? Uh, and by limited data, I mean not that we have insufficient data, we have insufficient labeled data. And so how can you exploit semi-supervised learning in that sense? Um, there's also an open call two project um, with regards to being able to do efficient models and being able to deploy that in that particular case for the robotic manipulation and horticulture, that's the open call too but applicable to many different robotic systems. Um, and obviously for a system to do weed management, we have this linear access system and we have four tools. And so there's work going on about how you plan the intervention action with these four different tools and potentially deploying learning for intervention, in deploying learning to do that intervention. And that's collaboration uh, with the junior research group leader and CP4, Marsha Popovich. And with that, if you need any further information, you're more than welcome to send me an email or go to our website.